Treasurer Joe Hockey has just joined me in the studio. Uh, welcome to 7.30, Treasurer. Great to be here. And congratulations on your first budget. We need to say that too. Well, thank you. Now, you've just delivered that budget. Um, it's a budget with a new tax, with levies, with co-payments. Um, is it liberating for a politician to decide election promises don't matter? Well, I, I don't accept that question. The biggest, the most significant promise we made was to fix the budget and strengthen the Australian economy, and we will. And this budget does that. But you, you say significant promise. What does that mean about all the other promises, particularly the Prime Minister made? Were they insignificant, frivolous, not to be taken no, seriously? No, they're all, all serious and they're all being implemented. Except that many of them have been broken. Um, well, that's your assertion. You are wrong. Uh, we are delivering in full on our promises uh, and we are going to deliver a stronger economy with more jobs and deliver a better quality of life to Australians in the future. Uh, let's, let's just stay with this and get this clear for a minute because what the, what the Prime Minister promised was uh, tax cuts and no new taxes. We've got a new tax. That's a broken promise. Well, you talk about honesty. You say it's the most important currency in politics. Isn't it time for you to have respect for the view voters, acknowledge what's happened so we can genuinely move on? Uh, well, uh, you can play those sort of games. It's not a game, but, sir. Well, you can, you, you, whatever you want to assert. The bottom line is as we show in the documents, as a result of what we've done since being elected, taxes are lower under the coalition than they would have been under Labor. You, you accept that? I accept that. Does right, that, OK, does... so that's the promise that we said we'd deliver lower taxes. We're getting rid of the carbon tax. We're getting rid of the mining tax. We're delivering tax cuts without a carbon tax. Uh, in addition to all of that, we are trying to fix the budget. Now, we can stand back and watch the house burn down or we can actually do things that ensure that our country has a, a sustainable and affordable quality of life and a number of initiatives in the budget focus on what we are going to do to improve our quality of life into the future. Just going forward, we'll come to those initiatives in just one moment, but um, are you saying that individual promises made by an opposition leader no longer matter? Well, we can spend the whole conversation talking about it's really, the process that's a, that's of promises, yes or no question. talking about the process of promises, I want to talk about the jobs we're creating. I want to talk about the infrastructure. I want to talk about what we're doing to build a stronger nation. All right, let's talk about some of the strongest themes in the budget because you've been talking about this being um, pain that was going to be equally shared. So I want to ask you this. No, I didn't use the term pain that is equally shared. I said pain that is shared. I think it is important that everyone do their fair share. All right, well, let's talk about fairness. How do you explain to, a working, to working families now facing higher fuel prices that mining companies, wealthy mining companies, get to keep their $2 billion um, diesel excise while ordinary motorists are going to pay almost the same amount in higher fuel prices? Well, the diesel excise is a business input cost and it's always been excluded uh, from the tax system because they don't use roads. But do you Obviously, think... when you're operating a mine, you don't use roads. So therefore, the tax you put on the diesel for the mine is not going towards road building, whereas consumers, we pay a tax as part of our petrol uh, and we use the roads and we get the benefit. And now what we're doing is attaching the inflation increase on the excise to our road building project to make sure it's sustainable. That's the key. You may not have said equally shared, but you did talk about sharing out the pain. So where in this budget, where, where is the corporate heavy lifting to equal the heavy lifting that's being asked of middle and lower income Australians? Well, the challenge that we face in Australia is that all the countries around us are heading towards a lower company tax rate. Now, we're only able to lower the company tax rate for 800,000 businesses. For larger businesses, we can't. So they're doing heavy lifting in a sense that they're losing out uh, in, a, in their competitiveness. Plus, we have a very high wage structure in Australia. So they're doing the heavy lifting. Uh, also, we're taking away over $800 million of industry subsidies. That's a start. That's out of a total of how much? $10 billion? Uh, no, it, won't, it isn't $10 billion because we're getting rid of a number of tariffs that is actually costing the budget money. So you regard that as what you've just described as heavy lifting for the corporate sector, is that well, right? Well, yes, but, but, but heavy lifting comes down to individuals. The corporate sector is a vehicle, a vehicle that represents us as individuals. We work for the corporate sector if we're employed by a company. So therefore, we all have to contribute. And as individuals, at the end of the day, it comes down to individual taxpayers. Well, let's talk about permanence then, because you've, you, you have introduced a levy for high-income earners, but it's a temporary levy, and yet the changes to the family payments are permanent. Why not make the deficit levy for high-income earners a permanent tax? Well, they already pay a considerable amount of tax, and the highest rate is considerably high. It is relatively high. 
everyone has to make a small contribution in one form or another. But also a tax on income goes to their primary source of income. In relation to family supplements, it's in addition to household income. So a supplement is a family payment is a supplement to the primary income of the household. Nonetheless, an argument for permanence in that higher tax rate would appear to offset some of the pain suffered by people paying dis disproportionately higher amounts of their um, wages or benefits, whatever they are. We want lower taxes, not higher taxes. Look, it, it, let's, let's look at a couple of examples. We struggle to work these out in the short time we've had available, so forgive, yeah. forgive us if we've got these sums right, but yeah. we think we're okay here. If you earn $250,000 and you're, being, you're paying the, um, the deficit, the high income deficit, you're going to pay about $1,400 as we understand it. If you're 24 and unemployed, you're going to lose nearly $2,500 in a year. Now, in that equation, who's doing heavy lifting? Well, the heavy lifting is always done by the taxpayer uh, and money received by an individual from the government is someone else's taxes. So what we want is for that unemployed person to get a job. And the best chance of them getting a job is someone else is earning taxes in creating business, making profit. If you do that, then they've got a chance of getting a job. Now, in, in the lead up to this budget, we had the Commission of Audit asking for much, uh, much stronger changes, in fact, to particularly to pensions and family welfare. Um, you've, made a, you've made a start, an important start, as you would have it, by reducing the family tax benefit B down to 100,000. But if you listen to the Commission of Audit, it's nowhere near enough. Is the age of entitlement still alive in Australia? Well, there is an age of entitlement, but it, it is over because we want to replace it with an age of opportunity. And the best thing you can do for someone uh, is help them to get away from a reliance on welfare and get into work if they have the capacity. And for those most vulnerable in the community, we have to ensure that the safety nets are sustainable and give them a fair go. Now, the bigger the safety net, the less you can do for those most vulnerable. But you understand that, for, for example, that young man on his unemployment benefits or a young mother who's 24 years old, the proportion of what she's going to take home, she's going to struggle to understand why somebody, a wealthy Australian, is going to take, a, frankly, a minuscule hit to their income. Well, I don't, I don't accept that. I don't accept that because the money is a supplement for that lady. It's a supplement. So she's just going to have to understand that economic argument. Well, uh, it's a supplement. She has a primary income elsewhere. All right, let's talk about the Medicare co-payment mm. because that uh, included a significant surprise today, which is the creation of a large fund for medical research. This was always going to be a hard sell. Um, are you, in a way, guilting people into supporting the payment, the Medicare co-payment, by no. attaching it to this medical research fund? No, this is good policy. This is good policy. If we invest in research now, and we're damn good at it in Australia, if we invest in medical research now, we might find the cures for dementia or Alzheimer's or something like that. We have that capacity. We've got the innovation. We've got the brain power. That's probably an but argument we just got to put money it. for it. That's probably an argument for doing it anyway. Well, there's not enough money to do it anyway. That's the bottom line. You can only create these things if you contribute. So when we're asking Australians, when you go to the doctor, pay $7. And if you're a concession card holder or a child, less, uh, it's uh, 10 visits a year you only have to pay for. But bottom line is if you contribute a little bit, we're going to get a lot in the future. But you understand at the same time it's going to make it much harder for the opposition and for the other parties to vote against it. Well, they should vote for good policy and it's good policy. Um, now, one of the things that people, I was talking about this just a moment ago, noticed uh, while we were sitting in the budget lockup was to do with um, schools and hospitals. As I understand it, that that the money to uh, the states for schools and hospitals is going to be cut by $80 billion over 10 years. Are you starving the states so that they beg you effectively to raise the GST? Well, that's up to them. They are responsible for schools and hospitals. We don't run any schools. We don't run any hospitals. But if you cut their funding by $80 billion, they're going to have to do something. So they're going to have to start the argument, the unpopular, unpalatable argument on the GST, not you. Well, the, all the GST goes to the states. So that's up to them. It's up to them. An ingenious piece of politics. Uh, well, it's good policy. What we're doing is good policy that is going to build a stronger economy. You know what? If you have a stronger economy, you have more people in work, you actually do get more revenue as a government. Now, in, in, in that putting off of the $80 billion or the reduction in funding to the states of $80 billion, where is the ongoing funding, the Gonski funding, to improve equity or um, well, we, we more committed. funding Well, you asked us to keep to our election promises, and we are. We said we'd fund four years of Gonski, and we are funding four years of Gonski. In fact, we're topping it up. 
So we actually put more money in after Labor ripped it out. We're putting more money into Gonski. But we said four years and that's it. And we're true to our word. So what happens after those four years? With those, that $80 billion reduction, does that mean that Gonski funding comes to an end at that point? Well, I expect the states will deal with it as they choose to deal with it. They run the schools. We don't run a school. Now, two of the more controversial tax hikes um, in this picture, that's the deficit levy and the um, Medicare co -payment. Two of the more controversial. Two well, there are only two tax adjustments of any adjustments. substance. Adjustments, is that what we're going well, to call them of, now? Of, of any substance. So any tax changes, if you like, or whatever you'd like to call it. New taxes. But whatever you'd like to call it, there's two. You know there's actually fewer than any of the previous uh, budgets from the previous government. They're so still, they're that, still that's taxes. That's a good sign. I don't need to teach okay. you, Treasurer, sure. what a tax is. You know that a co-payment, a levy and a tax are all taxes by any other so. name. Am I correct? Yes. So there are new taxes in your budget. There are increases in taxes. New yeah. taxes in your budget. Um, those co-payments and levies are not necessarily going to have, we'll find out more tonight, but they're not necessarily going to have the support to get through the Senate. How do you propose to plug the hole from those that revenue if they don't get through? Well, we'll wait and see what happens with the Greens and the Labor Party, but they've been pretty reckless so far, so I assume they'll continue their path. Do you have a contingency plan if they vote against well, them? Well, no. Our job is to lay down the policy that is good for the nation. Now, if Labor and the Greens don't want to support that, that's their call. But already, the Labor Party is opposing budget savings that they themselves took to the last election. They're not only opposing our promises at the last election, they're opposing their own promises at the last election to improve the budget bottom line. And just briefly, how committed are you to those changes? If they vote against them, are you prepared to go to a double dissolution? Well, we are putting up our plan to make the economy stronger. We make no apologies for that. Uh, the best thing we can do is what's right for the nation, and we expect uh, that the Labor Party, the Greens and everyone else will do what's right for the nation. We'll find out more this evening. Thank you very much indeed for Thank joining us, Treasurer. Great to be here.